finishing the show on a on a down note. Literally, <laughs> players moving down in the rankings. Maybe I didn't have to say literally. Maybe that was obvious that it was literal. I don't know. Um, Figuratively. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, uh, Jonathan Taylor is moving down in your rankings. He's been moving down, and he's in that round three range for me. So I'm basically avoiding Jonathan Taylor until I feel a lot more certain about what his future holds. It's just too murky right now. I don't like that the Colts are making multiple additions at, at running back and getting guys on and off the roster at that position. They seem to really be planning for, you know, at least beginning the year without Jonathan Taylor. It sounds crazy. It just sounds like that this thing could be mended quickly and Taylor's back in there. But what if this goes right up to the start of the season and Taylor doesn't practice in camp? He's there with the team, but he's not practicing. It just makes me nervous that he's going to, you know, suffer some sort of injury. We know that he was slow to recover from an ankle. He may or may not have a back problem. <laughs> and then you've got the issue of the quarterback taking work away from him, not just anywhere on the field, but also in short yardage goal line. I'm getting nervous about drafting Jonathan Taylor unless it's at a good price. Round three is where I have him ranked. I would consider him in late round two. Mixon, Ramondre, Taylor. Who's your favorite? Ramondre is ahead of Taylor. Taylor is one spot ahead of Mixon right now. Okay. And also on your fallers list is Chris Godwin. We talked about him. J.K. Dobbins. We talked about him. Samaj P. Ryan falling. He's falling because Javante Williams is rising. And it sounds like Williams is doing what we were hoping Brees Hall was going to do and that we thought Javante had no chance of doing. And that's mm -hmm. participating in training camp in the preseason. And he's apparently looking fine and he's going to get in some games before the season starts. And he might be Denver's lead running back to begin the year. I am certain that Piran's going to play in passing down situations. But I think Javante could end up being the 1A right away mm -hmm. in Denver. And that's something that we didn't necessarily see. He's going to go in that round five range. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people seem to think both of them are going to have roles. Both of them are going to have good fantasy value or at least mm -hmm. fantasy value. Well, P. Ryan's the bargain, if that's the case. Yeah. And he he's the guy that, like, you hope has early season value and then also has a handcuff. He's kind of like a super handcuff where... He has his own standalone value, hopefully, especially early on in the season before Javante is 100%. But then if there's any kind of setback with Javante, you know, Samaj P. Ryan probably ranked as a, a top 24 running back if yep. uh, Javante misses time. P. Ryan's ADP in August on NFC is 105.55. And Javante is at 59.32. It's yeah. easy to love P. Ryan's value there. But I was ranking him significantly higher because I thought that there was a chance that he could be a great early season running back. That doesn't look like that's going to happen anymore. I don't really like Javante that high. But I had been drafting a lot of Javante Williams. I thought that the hate was going a little bit too far, but that was like round seven. At the end of round five in a 12-team league, I do not think I'm comfortable drafting Javante there because you just always have to remind yourself, to re remind yourself, guys struggle Coming mm -hmm. off ACL injuries. I mean, right now you can say, oh, he's healthy. He's, he's going to play. He's going to play. Yeah, there's a difference between healthy and right. Exactly, exactly. It just it doesn't and, always happen. I mean, sometimes Adrian Peterson happens, but yeah. it, we have enough evidence. This is a serious injury to torn ligaments. You just can't expect him to and, be and elf. At Javante, look, there was a lot to like about him as a prospect. There was a lot to like about him coming into his career and what he showed, but he never had the high-end athleticism. For all he did really well, there was not the long speed. He was not a big play guy. He was not a breakaway guy. And that's before tearing two ligaments in his knee. So I just I think there's a decent chance that he comes out and just kind of looks like he's stuck in the mud for a little while. And, mm -hmm. you know, he relies so much on after contact, making guys miss. If he's not 100%, you know, it could be a situation where he's averaging 3.5 yards per carry for the first month. All right. But you are dropping DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, Dave, in your rankings. Uh, where are you? That's going? that's not because of anything they're doing. That's just because of Smith and Ajigba and mm -hmm. what he's doing. All right. Give me some context, though. Who did you move Metcalf behind? Who did you move Lockett behind? Metcalf is currently behind. Give me a second. He's behind Watson. He's behind Debo. Uh, I'm still taking DeAndre Hopkins in full PPR out of DK Metcalf. I'm seeing Metcalf get drafted a lot earlier than I thought that he should. Because I do think there could be 
a semblance of a target crunch form. And I wonder if there's going to be a red zone target crunch form as well, just given how excited everybody is about Smith and the Jigba in Seattle and what defenses are probably going to try and do to begin the season. And especially in the red zone, I think they're still going to lean toward trying to take Metcalf away. I'll tell you what, he still has a top 30 ADP on NFC. Yeah. No, if, if you guys, you, everybody on CBS is right. uh, If everyone, well, at least I'm looking at the rankings, Jamie, Dave, and Heath. If everyone's right about DK Metcalf, then he is currently one of the most overdrafted players because Dave is still the high guy on Metcalf and he has him 22. I've got 15. You have him 15. I've got him and, and both him and Lockett. I actually, there are two players that I project higher than I actually rank them. Lockett. I'm just going to draft Lockett everywhere. (laughs) He's on like literally every single team I've drafted this season because he's going as a wide receiver three. I, I projected him. His projection is wide receiver 16. I have him ranked wide receiver 23. I just think this is a really good passing game. Those are elite players. Yes, Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to play a role, but I don't think like this idea that he's just going to come in and usurp either of those guys, I think is unlikely. Lockett just like, yes, he's been the most probably relative to price, the most valuable player in fantasy for like five years in a row. He's just (laughs) consistently outperforms what we expect. We've, We've done this with DK Metcalf. All oh, the young high end prospect is going to overtake Tyler Lockett. I think it's happened once in four seasons where where Metcalf has outperformed Lockett. I just I'll bet on the elite talents here. I'll bet on those guys continuing to be really really productive players. And Metcalf, the big dip last year, his yards after catch went from at least four point four per reception in each of his first three seasons to just two point four last year. Nothing oh. else really changed. You know, his average depth of target catch rate, we're all within the realm of his or the range of his career norms. I think that's probably just a fluke. And this is a guy who a couple of years ago was a 1300 yard, 10 touchdown guy. So I, 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 I get the concerns and there, there are some, some scenarios where Smith and Jigba, you know, takes such a big chunk of the passing game that those guys are hurt, but I'll take the value with Metcalf and lock it falling in the rankings. I just do you have it on? Do you have it on the top of your head? What Metcalf's targets per game were in that thirteen hundred ten touchdown season? Uh, lower than I've they got were it right last here. Year. That was three seasons ago. So he's Metcalf has had two bad seasons in a row by his, his eight targets per game. By mm-hmm. certainly by his twenty twenty standards, but um, I I think there's so much at play here. I mean, it's so interesting because you look at Lockett and he is going to be thirty one years old. Yep, and yep. He had more than 68 yards in one of his last 12 games, including the play. But that's Tyler Lockett. No, no. This is much worse than that. This is uh, – there were very few – he was saved by touchdowns last year. It was weird. And and this was a, this was worse. And at that age, I always bring this up, it does remind me a little bit of Adam Thielen. So that's – But Thielen's per target metrics and per route metrics took a big hit, which wasn't necessarily the case with Lockett. Okay. Yeah, I'm mean, more optimistic. And like, what range was it after week five? You said it was his last twelve games, including the playoffs. So his last. I mean that that's season games. More one game with more than sixty eight yards sounds a lot worse than six games with at least sixty. But it's which is a thousand yard pace. Yeah, yeah, but that's in a seventeen game season. A thousand yards is really scoring nine touchdowns. It's pretty good. If you're scoring the touchdowns and. A thousand and nine is good. Yeah. He's yeah. But I'm just, this is what Tyler Lockett does. If he's declining, then it makes me feel more confident in DK Metcalf. If he's not declining, then I'm, then I think the middle of round three is, is probably too soon for Metcalf because you're not getting that. You might be getting value based on Dave, Jamie, and Heath's rankings, but -hmm. based on where he's actually going in drafts, you're not getting that value yet for DK Metcalf. That could, that could change. He could be an ADP follower, not just a rankings follower if the JSN buzz is still carrying on but so far it hasn't happened all right i want to make sure we get to chris's fallers here so michael Pittman is actually a mutual one so i'll let uh that's the last one for dave it's one for chris so i'll let you start chris uh michael Pittman is a faller for you and for dave yeah i just one the whole jonathan taylor situation has me thinking that this might just be a disaster season for the colts which wouldn't be an outlier for them uh last season was pretty disastrous as well but for me, it's mostly just when when they first drafted Anthony Richardson, I was like, man, this is the most talented quarterback Michael Pittman's ever played for. And then I started actually doing the, the thought process of how much are they going to throw? How good are the targets going to be? And it's 
it's probably a net downgrade from last season where I, I assumed it might not be. And, you know, it, it's mostly just in the sober light of day. I realized that Michael Pittman's not really someone that I, I think has much upside. He's actually not even a top 36 wide receiver for me. I see the same for Jamie and Heath. Um, if I get him as my number four wide receiver, I think that's okay. As my number five, as a bench guy, that's probably what I prefer, but he's just not someone who's going to be a priority for me. And Dave has him 35th. So not yeah. as, he's the high guy at 35 on Pittman. Ramondre Stevenson, a follower for you, Chris, to where? Hmm. Uh, he was, he opened the, the draft season as like RB seven for me. Now he's more like RB 12. I've got him sandwiched between, uh, Mixon and Travis Etienne, and I, there's definitely a path to upside. But one thing that I've really come to realize throughout this process is Bill O'Brien's offenses do not throw to their running backs. This is it's kind of shocking. We think of his time with New England, that was actually one of the worst seasons that the Patriots have ever had in terms of throwing to their running backs. 9.5% of their passes in 2011 when Bill O'Brien was the offensive coordinator were thrown to their running backs. That was with Tom Brady. It was also like Wes Welker and Rob Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez was like kind of the peak of that offense. But still, that was a thing in his uh, time in Texas, in, in Houston, the second lowest target share of any team during Bill O'Brien's time in Houston. Uh, and even like David Johnson and Duke Johnson, two really good pass catching running backs in Houston combined for a 16.3% target share. That was all their running backs that year. So it's just... It might not be as good a situation for running backs as we've gotten used to in New England. And then it seems pretty likely they're going to add someone, you know, whether it's Leonard Fournette or Dalvin Cook. It seems pretty likely that it's not just going to be Pierre Strong and Kevin Harris mm -hmm. as Ramondre Stevenson's primary competition. So I just I think there are more ways for things to go poorly from here than there are ways for them to go really, really well. How dare you forget about Ty Montgomery? Also Ty Montgomery. Yes. <laughs> In that backfield mix. Uh, just one thing. Where did Bill O'Brien call plays last year? Uh, does it matter, though? I mean, the, I think it matters. College, the collegiate level. Uh, he's making use of the talent that he has, which is. But Stevenson market. wasn't really a great pass catch. He was a he was a, an enthusiastic and active pass catcher. But on a per <laughs> yeah, target, was, per right, route no basis. McCaffrey. Stevenson wasn't like a difference maker in the passing game. It was it was all volume. No, but he need we needed those fantasy points from him in order yes. to be good. And so the question is, can he get them back? And there is a little bit of concern there, but I also think that they don't they they've painted themselves into a corner with their run game. And Stevenson's got to be their guy. And so it's hopefully, game, hopefully yeah. the offensive line takes a step forward, and Stevenson can at least match what he did last year. He averaged 14.3 PPR points per game in six games without Damian Harris. That number feels a little low. That's not where you want to take a running back uh, with a top 30 pick. You want to get somebody after that if that's the expectation. I'm hoping he's used a little bit more and exceeds that mark this year. Yeah, I just right. It's Is he really going to catch? First of all, like I've said, he wasn't even a third down back. He caught. 69 passes and only 12 on third down. So right. they, which is good. That's a plus. If it, you ask me. it can be just, you just never know year to year. And I the only thing is, you know, you talk about the bill O'Brien offense. So Chris, I mean, I wonder when you have Deandre Hopkins, was that the bigger factor? Why throw to the running backs when you get yeah, Deshaun Watson too? Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, there are, there and are things that, good. yeah, yeah. There are things that play into it across the board, but it was just, it was so consistent over so many years. And it wasn't just, the Deshaun Watson era, it was when, you know, they had Ryan Mallett starting one season, like though. And it's hard to know, like, Hey, is Ryan Mallett actually doing what Bill oh. O'Brien wants him to that? That's a fair question at, at that time. But like, I, mean, I, I, I we shouldn't be going this far. Yeah, we back. Should be. All right. Let's move to Ken Walker here, Chris, uh, Ken Walker, a faller for you. I talked about it with you yesterday on FFT and five, you know, could it get to the point where Ken Walker falls so far that mm -hmm. it's more appealing? Yeah, right. I think like when you talk about the the ADP, it's possible that he falls, but he was still before this injury being drafted arguably as a top 15 running back. He was going ahead of like Joe Mixon and Aaron Jones. I just, I didn't love that value for a guy who probably doesn't have a ton of passing game upside and really needed to dominate rushing work. And now that he's dealing with the, the concern for me, hopefully he's healthy, but it's just 
it was a groin injury last year that required surgery and training camp. Now it's a groin injury again. So the recurring nature of that does make me think there's just a little bit of risk there. Okay. That's an interesting take. When would you take Ken Walker? Uh, he's like RB 20 ish for me. So I'm fine with him in, I don't know the, the 55 to 60 range. That's exactly where his NFC ADP is living right now. Yep. 55.6. Good value there. Drake London, a faller for you, Chris. Yeah, this is another one where just kind of like Pittman, I uh, was initially enthusiastic and then you start to do the math and it's like, man, unless this team just throws a ton more, I can't justify him as a wide receiver too. He's more like a wide receiver three for me. I would rather have Marquise Brown, even though I do think Drake London's a better player. Um, and then reports out of Atlanta's uh, camp have, have not been super positive as far as Desmond Ritter's performance. So I'm just, I'm a little worried there, especially with how high the bar is to be a, a relevant fantasy wide receiver. And Anthony Richardson, you know, actually Heath put it pretty well. He's been pretty publicly saying I'm, I'm lower on Richardson than Dave, Jamie and Heath are. They have him as a top 10 quarterback. But when you look at the position, he made a good point on the quarterback's preview. Why not draft Richardson first higher than, you know, what I might rank him mm -hmm. uh, and then take someone later who's still going to be available like an Aaron Rodgers or a Geno Smith or so, whoever you like in that range, Jared Goff. I'm not going to do that. Now. I won't get into it. Um, I could speak for a minute or two on that, but I won't, but I think there's a reason not to do it. But Chris, what, what do you think about Richardson? Where, why did you drop him? I opened camp with him as like the number eight quarterback and I've moved him to like 10 or 11. It's for me, it's mostly just once you start doing the projection, unless you're just projecting him for like 900 rushing yards, he's probably going to be so unproductive as a passer that if he's anything short of the second best rushing quarterback in the NFL, he's probably not going to be worth starting. I mean, we saw Justin Fields last season really, really good. That was one of, if not the best rushing seasons we've ever seen from a quarterback. And he was, you know, overall fine. He was like, what, QB eight over the course of the full season in points per game. That just that feels like drafting Anthony Richardson at his ceiling. Cause he's probably going to throw maybe 400 passes. It's still not a hundred percent certain. He's even going to open camp or the regular season as the starter. It just, I can't justify taking him over to uh, and Deshaun Watson, two guys that we've d seen the high level upside from. I, I, I could justify Dak Prescott and Daniel Jones and Geno Smith. I think it's fine to take him ahead of those guys, but, if I'm looking for a starting quarterback, I'll take Tua and Deshaun Watson over him. 